Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Cleveland State University, Robert Conrad, and the Payne Fund. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Kay Rodolfi, a member of the City Club's Board of Directors and co-chair of its Advancement Committee. I am pleased to introduce today's speaker, Lillian Faderman, winner in the nonfiction category for the 81st Annual Annisfield Wolf Book Awards. The Annisfield Wolf Book Awards were established in 1935 by poet and philanthropist Edith Annisfield Wolf in honor of her father, John Annisfield, and her husband, Eugene Wolf. As stated on the awards website, the awards, quote, recognize books that have made important contributions to our understanding of racism and our appreciation of the rich diversity of human cultures, unquote. The Cleveland Foundation, the world's first community foundation, has administered the award since 1963. In addition, the Cleveland Foundation has a longstanding history of supporting the LGBT LGBT community beginning as early as the 1980s as lead funders in the community for services, treatments, and advocacy efforts related to the AIDS epidemic. In 2014, the Cleveland Foundation served as the presenting sponsor for Gay Games 9. <laughs> And just recently, the foundation was ranked number four of the top 10 funders supporting LGBT communities in the Midwest. The City Club is pr proud to partner with the foundation to provide a forum for the winners of these distinguished awards. Ms. Faderman is considered a leading scholar of LGBT history. The Gay Revolution, The Story of the Struggle, is Ms. Faderman's 10th book. It opens with two stories, one taking place in 1948 and one in 2012, highlighting the leaps and bounds that the LGBT community has made in the past 50 years. She chronicles the milestones and heroes we all know about, the Stonewalls, the Harvey Milks, as well as others who we do not know about. The Economist praised the book as, quote, the most comprehensive history to date of America's gay rights movie, movement, end quote. But it is arguably a largely unfinished work reflecting the continued evolution of gay civil rights in America. The 2015 landmark Supreme Court decision that granted the fundamental right to marry to same-sex couples did not mark the end of the struggle. It is just another milestone in a journey that many consider far from over. Despite this Supreme Court decision and the passage of subsequent laws prohibiting sexual orientation or gender identity discrimination, state-by-state -state law varies within the LGBT community leaving many members vulnerable to discrimination in housing, at work, and most recently in bathrooms. How did we arrive at this moment? What is the next in the step in the battle for gay rights? Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club, please join me in welcoming 2016 Annisfield Book Award winner for nonfiction, Lillian Faderman. My book, The Gay Revolution, was published uh, last year. I started it in um, 2010, and by then, uh, Don't Ask, Don't Tell was on its way to being repealed. And before I finished the book in uh, June of 2015, thank you, <laughs> the Supreme Court um, decided Obergefell v. Hodges, which is an, an Ohio case, as I'm sure you knew, and it decreed that um, to deny same-sex couples the right to marry was unconstitutional. So we have the right to marry everywhere in America now. I knew for sure that I was doing the right thing in writing this book because when we got those rights, everyone seemed to be saying, oh wow, that was quick. <laughs> but it has not been quick. It's been a struggle of many, many decades. And that's what I want to trace in the next half hour. My book is uh, over 800 pages, and I'm going to condense 800 pages into half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I'll look at uh, three periods. The first is the early homophile movement when for the first time LGBT people started organizing to fight persecution. And incidentally, we weren't called LGBTQQIAAPP then. <laughs> We, we were all called gay in the gay underground, and uh, straight people knew us all as homosexuals. The second period is the radical period that started with uh, an event that everyone knows about, the riots at the Stonewall Inn. And then the third period is the mainstreaming of the gay rights movement that focused on winning all the rights of first-class American citizenship for LGBTQ people. So I'm gonna start in the 1950s, and just as a personal note, I, I came out as a lesbian into the Los Angeles uh, gay subculture in the 1950s. It was probably the, the worst time in the 20th century to come out. My timing was awful. Uh, to, the, to the churches, we were all sinners. To the government, we were all subversives. To the police, we were all criminals. This is uh, uh, an article about uh, the story with which I begin the book, a professor at the University of Missouri who was arrested because it was rumored that he was a sodomite and he was fired from his job and it began a witch hunt in Missouri. To the psychiatrists, we were all crazies. This is a photo of uh, two psychiatrists administering um, positive and negative reinforcement to a homosexual to change him into a heterosexual. It was just about this time that homosexuals started to organize, though, to fight against those injustices. Harry Hay was um, a member of the Communist Party, and it was probably his radical views that made it easier for him to conceive of organizing homosexuals. He was also influenced by one other thing, and that was um, uh, the uh, Alfred Kinsey book on sexuality in the American male that came out in 1948, and it said that there were uh, uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions and millions of people in the United States that had homosexual experiences. So he decided there must be a lot of people who would be willing to join an organization to fight persecution against homosexuals. But he was wrong. He had a very hard time getting anyone interested. And then he had a brainstorm. In July 1950, he took a petition that was sponsored by the Communist Party. He took it to a, a beach in Los Angeles where gay people would hang out. The Korean War had just started, and the petition demanded that US troops be recalled from Korea. It was very controversial and very dangerous to sign such a petition because it was sponsored by the uh, CP. But Hay had no trouble getting 500 signatures right there on, on the beach. He did it for several weekends in a row. And then right after a person would sign, he would say, would you also be interested in joining a group to talk about Alfred Kinsey's findings on sexual deviancy? Not a single person said yes. And the point is it was much less dangerous, or it was, it, they felt anyway, that it was less dangerous to be thought a communist in 1950 than to be known as a homosexual. Well, finally, he, uh, he did get just a handful of people to agree that they would join the secret group, and they called it the Mattachine Society. And Harry Hay defined homosexuals as a minority, comparable to other groups that suffered prejudice. He said, we are an oppressed cultural minority was the first time anyone had conceptualized homosexuality that way, an oppressed cultural minority. But it was still very hard to get the group to grow. Everyone was very scared. It wasn't clear what they could do about oppression until finally um, this man, Dale Jennings, was arrested in a case that was uh, very common. He was entrapped by a vice squad officer. He claimed that he did not do anything wrong. The vice squad officer said that Dale Jennings made a pass at him. It, it happened hundreds of thousands of times. 
Usually, what would happen is that the person would plead no contest or guilty or whatever. They'd be given a fine, and that would be the end of it, except it would go on the record. Mattachine said to Dale Jennings, you have to fight it. You have to go to court, demand a jury trial. We're going to pay for your defense. And you have to say, yes, I am a homosexual, but just because I'm a homosexual does not mean that I'm guilty of what I was accused of doing. And he was exonerated. That was the first time anything like that had happened. And so Mattachine began to grow. It, it was never huge, but there were uh, branches of Mattachine all over the country. And then eventually there, were, uh, there was a woman's organization, Daughters of Belitis. Those two are founders of Daughters of Belitis. It was, it was a fairly tame organization. I think that Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon, the two women in the picture, really did want it to be political. But it was so hard for people to commit themselves to, to a fight for gay rights when it was so criminal to be known as a gay person. But the one important thing that Daughters of Belitis did is they started a magazine called The Ladder. And that was very vital because for the first time, it actually showed positive images of lesbians. And other lesbians all across the country could see those images. This is Lily Vinsanz, who was an early member of Daughters of Belitis. Before that, the images were always of, of uh, neurotic, uh, sick women who uh, belonged either in psychiatry or belonged in jail. They also, for the first time, challenged um, psychiatric uh, so-called uh, knowledge, psychiatric wisdom on homosexuality as a disease. But, uh, and, and the article that you see is by Frank Kameny, and I'll be talking about him uh, in, in a few minutes. Uh, it was an article that really took on these psychiatrists for the first time. But there was conflict in, in all of these groups from the very beginning, because some members really loved Harry Hayes' lines about homosexuals that said, we are an oppressed cultural minority. That is, we are different from the majority, and we only demand to be left alone to live our lives as we see fit without persecution. But there were other members of the groups that argued, as Frank Kameny did, and um, as the editor of the latter, Barbara Giddings, did, that except for the insignificant difference of who we love, homosexuals are just like everyone else. That is, we're not a minority. We're just American citizens who are suffering from society's prejudice, and we want all the same rights that every American should have, which means, for example, the right to serve in the military and the right to get married. And this became one of the major conflicts in the gay movement that exists until this day. Are we just like everyone else except for the insignificant difference of sexual preference or gender identification? Or are we a distinct cultural minority who shouldn't want to assimilate by serving in the military or getting married or doing other things that, quote, bourgeois normals do? One of my uh, biggest heroes of the book is the man that I, I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, Frank Kameny. He's a very interesting person. He, he got a PhD from Harvard in astronomy in the 1950s. And the first job that he took was for the um, Army Map Service. It was a civilian job. And he was doing very well on the job until the Civil Service Commission did a routine background check and found that he had once been arrested for homosexuality. So he was immediately dismissed from his job. His security clearance was taken away from him. And he decided to fight it. He appealed to absolutely everyone, the Civil Service Commission, the Pentagon, uh, who was in charge of the Civil Service Commission, um, every member of Congress. He wrote every member of Congress individually. Um, he appealed to the president. He appealed to the Supreme Court. 
no one would pay any attention to him. Finally, he formed a branch of the Mattachine Society in Washington in 1961, and he took that organization further than it had ever been before. And the reason he was able to do it, I think, is uh, he was very influenced by Martin Luther King and the, uh, the March on Washington, the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. He actually went with a, a contingent of uh, Mattachine members. They held up Mattachine signs at the march, which was much less brave than it sounds because nobody knew what Mattachine was, but, <laughs> but they were a, a presence there in any case. Um, and one of the uh, Mattachine members said, why can't we do something like this? Why can't we have a gay march? Well, of course, they couldn't have a gay march because there weren't enough out gay people who would be willing to participate in a march. But they were able to do something else. They were able to um, gather pickets. And the first picket in front of the White House was 10 people. And eventually, they picketed the Pentagon and the Civil Service Commission and Independence Hall in Philadelphia. At the most, they got 45 people. But that, that was the beginning. That was the first time gay people dared to appear in public, this was in 1965, and say we are homosexual and we demand our rights. Frank Kameny also tried to get a meeting with President Lyndon Johnson. Obviously, he, um, he failed. This is 1965, and you could see from the expression on the guard's face that he was not going to get very far. But he, uh, he goaded um, gay people who'd been fired from civil service jobs to fight the government to get their jobs back. And by the late 1960s, they were beginning to succeed. The courts actually began to tell the Civil Service Commission that there had to be a nexus, that is a connection, between the person's homosexuality and poor job performance. And if there wasn't that kind of nexus, then that person couldn't be fired. He also took on the American Psychiatric Association. Um, homosexuality was in um, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And Frank Kameny and Barbara Giddings, who's the woman in the picture, decided that they would fight the American Psychiatric Association. Eventually, the fight grew to many other people. But in this picture that you're looking at, um, it's a panel with Frank Kameny, Barbara Giddings, and a gay psychiatrist who agreed to appear, but he said, I can't appear as me. And so he's wearing a fright wig and a, um, a crimped mask of Richard Nixon as he, <laughs> as he gives his presentation. And so eventually, in 1973, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders took homosexuality out as uh, uh, one of the mental disorders. The second period that I'm going to look at, I'll call the radical period, when uh, Harry Hayes' idea about LGBTQ people, or gay people, is, as he would have said, being an oppressed cultural minority was, again, dominant among activists. That period started almost at the very end of the 1960s, when uh, young gay kids decided that what black militants did, and again, it's, it's the influence of the black movement that preceded the gay movement, that what black militants did in the 1960s, gay people needed to do too. And so uh, famously, of course, on June 28th, 1969, the Stonewall Inn in New York, was raided, and instead of going quietly into a paddy wagon, as almost always happened when a bar was raided, um, the young people who were at the Stonewall decided they would riot. This is the second day of the riots, and just before the uh, second set of riots begin. And you can uh, see how different these kids are from Harry Hay and, uh, uh, not Harry Hay, but I, I should say Frank Kameny and Barbara Giddings, who were very proper in their presentation. And these kids just were very daring and camped it up as much as they wanted to. 
just a week or two after the riots, some of them met and they started a group called the Gay Liberation Front. And that was a group that was um, unlike uh, any of the earlier gay groups. This is a Gay Liberation Front dance. It, the, the group was political, but it was celebratory too. It was Bacchanalian in its dances. There was just this huge energy. Must have been a, a terrific relief after feeling for years like society's pariahs to suddenly know you could take charge of your own life, you could celebrate yourself, you understood that it was society's prejudices that were sick and that gay people were perfectly fine. But these kids and people like them really separated themselves from people like Frank Kameny with his suit and tie and, and his saying, we're just like everyone else and we want the rights of first class citizenship. They were much more like uh, Harry Hay, the first founder of the Mattachine Society. This is Harry Hay in old age, and he was uh, died in his 90s, and, and uh, he was hippie-like into old age. <laughs> The Gay Liberation Front was extremely radical. They weren't interested in getting a little piece of the American pie. They thought the whole pie was rotten, the whole capitalist, racist system was rotten, and they wanted to throw it all out and start all over again. Their statement of purpose said, quote, sexual liberation for all people cannot come about unless existing social institutions are abolished. And in place of those bourgeois institutions, they wanted to create new social forms based on, quote, brotherhood, cooperation, human love, and uninhibited sexuality. And of course, they struck a chord with, with young gay people all over the country, and, and uh, uh, Gay Liberation Front groups were started in big cities everywhere. But they spent a lot of time talking and raising each other's consciousness in the lingo of the day, and not much time doing. So after a little while, <laughs> So after a little while, there, there were some GLFers that decided they had enough of raising consciousness, and they wanted to work in a group that would focus on getting gay rights. And so they broke away from GLF, and they formed an organization they called the Gay Activists Alliance. Like the Gay Liberation Front, they were uh, bold and uh, noisy and impolite. They love to be in face of uh, the authorities. Um, I, I love uh, this slide with uh, Arthur Evans, a member of the Gay Activist Alliance, carrying a sign because um, the uh, New York Board of Education was firing people if they discovered they were homosexual. And Arthur Evans' sign says, was Socrates a lousy teacher? <laughs> or they also confronted um, the New York State Board of Examiners. Uh, the New York State Board of Examiners was in charge of professional licensing, and if someone was discovered to be a homosexual, their license was revoked or they were denied a license in the first place. And so the, this is a, a wonderfully confrontational picture, typical of, of the members of the group. Their tactics were very radical. They staged political protests, and they were happy to be arrested at those protests because they knew that whenever they had a confrontation with the police, word of their movement would spread to newspapers and magazines. This is a member of the Gay Activist Alliance being ushered into a police van at one of the protests. What used to happen before when a gay person was ushered into a police van, he would hang his head and go quietly and miserably. But you can see here that Morty Manford, the Gay Activist Alliance member, is cheering his friends on. Despite their style, Gay Activist Alliance members were in some ways really assimilationists. They really did want a piece of the pie, and they made very concrete demands for gay rights. They fought, for example, to get cities all over the country to pass gay ordinances, saying that gay people would not be discriminated against in housing, in employment, and public accommodations. 
And with their successes, gays got more attention from the media ever before. And the word um, gay was actually becoming a household word. When I came out in 1956, gay was an underground word. In fact, that's the way we would often make contact with each other. If you suspected another woman was a lesbian, you might say, are you gay? And if she said, well, I'm a little depressed today, or something like that, <laughs> then, then you, you, knew that <laughs> you knew she wasn't. <laughs> But in any case, homosexuality, thanks to the Gay Activist Alliance, was no longer the love that dared not speak its name. Eventually, the group succeeded in attracting thousands all over the country. They were getting huge press. They were making it more appealing for gay people to come out of the closet because you no longer had to feel that you were alone. You, you knew that there were many other gay people all over the country. Which brings me to phase three. A man by the name of uh, Bruce Voller had been a president of the Gay Activist Alliance in New York. He quit his day job as professor of biology at Rockefeller University um, because he wanted to devote full time to the movement. But in 1973, he decided, number one, that the Gay Activist Alliance wasn't moving fast enough in getting gay rights. Number two, the radical style of some of its members was counter to his goal of getting first class citizenship for all gay people. And number three, there needed to be a national gay organization that could fight for gay rights on both a state and a federal level. And so he founded the National Gay Task Force. In this picture, um, members of the National Gay Task Force are leaving the White House after a meeting not with Jimmy Carter, but with Jimmy Carter's aide, uh, Midge Costanza, a meeting in which they talked about what gay people need in order to be first class citizens. And so they finally got through the doors of the White House in any case. Just one other example of, of what the National Gay Task Force accomplished. In 1974, uh, the ABC network had a popular series called Marcus Welby, MD, and there was one episode that they called the outrage in which Dr. Welby helps catch a homosexual junior high school science teacher who rapes a 14-year-old boy. And then um, there was um, another uh, NBC program um, featuring Angie Dickinson called Police Woman. And there was an episode on there where Angie Dickinson pursued and caught lesbian murderers. And th those were the only kinds of TV <laughs> images there were. Either we were rapists or we were murderers. Well, the National Gay Task Force demanded and actually got a meeting with TV studio heads and convinced them that such images were unfair and false and did harm to many people. And the studio heads actually promised they would change. And eventually, that, would, uh, that led to programs uh, such as the comedy series Ellen and Ellen DeGeneres coming out on the cover of Time magazine just about the time that she came out in her comedy series. And it led to Will and Grace. I, I, uh, I'm sure some of you remember that Vice President Joe Biden said when, the, uh, when marriage became an issue that there was nothing that changed his mind about gay people as much as watching Will and Grace did. <laughs> and it also led eventually to programs such as Glee and Modern Family and Transparent and all of the very sympathetic TV treatments of LGBTQ people. But those did not exist before the National Gay Task Force and then other gay groups approached the media and said, this has got to stop. You've got to stop representing us as rapists and murderers. It was also at the time of the National Gay Task Force in the early 1970s that other mainstreaming organizations formed, such as the Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund, that fought for the rights of gay people to serve in the military and to stay in the Boy Scouts and the National Gay Rights Lobby, which eventually became the Human Rights Campaign, whose purpose was to have a presence in Washington, D.C. to lobby Congress for gay rights. These mainstreaming groups defined the demands and they made a big difference. 
but alone they don't account for the huge progress that we've made. So progress snowballed because several things came together or one thing followed another. First of all, uh, just to reiterate at the very beginning, it was radicals who certainly started the ball rolling. It was Harry Hay and the Stonewall Rebellion and the Gay Liberation Front. But once things got started, more moderate or mainstream people jumped in and they focused the battle. Another thing that had to happen is that when faced with a common enemy, all factions of the LGBT community had to learn to work together. And it took a long time for them to do that. There, there was often a lot of dissension within the groups. But I think they, they learned it particularly well when Anita Bryant, the uh, fundamentalist pop singer in the late 1970s, was successful in leading the charge to repeal a gay rights ordinance in Miami. And that was quickly followed by repeals of other gay rights ordinances in Wichita and uh, Eugene, or Oregon, and St. Paul, Minnesota. And finally, they realized that if they don't hang together, they'll hang separately, and gay people managed, all factions of the community managed to work together and defeated the Briggs Initiative, for instance, in, in California. But perhaps the most important thing that had to happen before we could make the progress that we've made is that a critical mass of us had to come out. And just a, a couple of statistics that I want to give you. In the 1990s, only about 22% of Americans, according to a Gallup poll, said that they had a close friend or family member who was lesbian or gay. And so it's not surprising that it was in the 90s that Don't Ask, Don't Tell was passed and that the Defense of Marriage Act was passed because most people didn't realize that, that it would affect someone that they loved. In uh, 2010, Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed. That's uh, Lieutenant Dan Choi protesting the don't ask, don't tell policy. And um, uh, more and more Americans were saying by 2010 that they approved of same-sex marriage. And it's very significant that around that time, the number of Americans who said that they had a close friend or family member who was lesbian or gay rose to 65%. That is about three times what it had been uh, in the 1990s. And now it's more like 75%. Because so many of us have come out, we've gone from being perceived as pariahs who lurk in the shadows ready to pounce on some 14-year-old kid to being acknowledged as sons and daughters and aunts and uncles and cousins and beloved neighbors and good friends. And then finally, another thing that helped hugely was that we had to have someone in the White House who would take the moral responsibility to acknowledge us as fellow Americans worthy of first-class citizenship. That's, um, Fred, uh, I'm sorry, whoop. There we go. That's Frank Kameny, who's, uh, it's 2009, and he's uh, at the White House uh, shaking hands, obviously, with our president. Um, and this is uh, the occasion of extending federal benefits to same-sex partners of federal employees. But you remember this uh, oh dear. 1965 picture of Frank Kameny, the same man, trying desperately to uh, deliver a petition to President Johnson. This picture uh, was taken two years before Kameny's death. He died in uh, 2011. In 2009, he was invited to the White House three times for special occasions that honored LGBT Americans. So that was really a very happy ending to his story. Obviously, not all of our battles are over. As we know all too well, 
In many states, including this state, I believe, you can be married to your same-sex partner on Sunday and be fired from your job on Monday because we still don't have federal protections. There's still no Employment Non-Discrimination Act that we've been trying to get for uh, more than 20 years. We still haven't been added to the 1964 Civil Rights Act that outlaws discrimination in American life. But I'm, I'm personally very hopeful for the future because I have witnessed personally such incredible progress uh, in the past. The, the country certainly seems to be on the right track, though LGBT people and the millions and millions of straight American allies need to keep working hard to exercise constant vigilance to make sure that it stays that way. Thank you. Today we are enjoying a Friday Forum with Lillian Faderman, the 2016 Annisfield Wolf Book Award winner for nonfiction. We are about to begin the audience Q&A. We welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, or those of you joining us via our radio broadcast, webcast, or our new live simulcast at the Parma Snow branch of the Cuyahoga County Public Library. If you would like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will try to work it into the program. We want to remind you that your questions should be brief, to the point, and actually be questions. Holding the microphones today are content coordinator Teddy Eisenberg and director of programming Stephanie Jansky. May we have the first question, please? Hi. Uh, oh, got it. Um, I came out uh, in the middle 1980s. And my perspective at the time was that ACT UP and the AIDS epidemic had a huge um, power too, and I wanted to ask if you would comment for a couple seconds yes, on that. Yes, absolutely huge, and I, I talk about that at some length in, in my book. Um, ACT UP was very much influenced by the radical branch of the movement, and it's exactly what was needed at that time. There, there were certainly um, uh, branches that were more like in the style of Frank Kameny in Los Angeles, for instance. There was uh, AIDS Project Los Angeles that did wonderful things that raised millions of dollars to help people with AIDS, but it was ACT UP and the uh, uh, people who began with that organization and went on to do other things like agitate the Center for Disease Control and uh, agitate the National Institutes of Health that really made a difference in the protocol for drug testing and the distribution of drugs for AIDS and the price of uh, AIDS drugs. So yes, ACT UP was absolutely essential, yes. Your history is wonderfully, explicitly political, great pulling together of things which have scattered out over the landscape over the last 50, 60 years. But it is not uh, as psychological as <clears throat> my question would be. Behind the political events, there was a psychological freeing up in the minds of the people who were most affected, who needed to come out and speak up. Can you talk at all about what you learned of that inner psychological process, the dawning of enough self-confidence, enough pride yeah. to be open and gay and proud? Yeah. yeah, thank you for that question. That's a good one. I, I think that the psychological process was so dependent on the few brave people that dared to come out, people like Harry Hay and, and Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon who dared to start these organizations and then the young radicals who dared to say, we're not taking this, we're, we're fighting back. I think it was so important for people who were closeted to understand that, that you don't have to take it, you, you can fight back, you can demand first class American citizenship. You can demand that the truth about you be told. But that, that wouldn't have been possible if there hadn't been this 
critical mass of people earlier who came out and wrote the newspaper articles and, and published the magazines that made it safer for others to come out. And then slowly it, it snowballed and more and more people felt safe to, to come out. Um, but I, I, I think before the beginning of the uh, early parts of the movement, it, it was so frightening to be known as a homosexual because you felt that you were totally alone. There was just total isolation. And once a critical mass said, we're here too, you're not alone, it made it so much easier for more and more people to come out. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming. I, I really thought your uh, remarks were just fantastic. I have sort of a lighthearted question to ask you. Uh, I saw the PBS documentary, The Pursuit, which you were on, and I thought it was a, a ter terrific documentary. It was very moving, and there were parts of it that were very funny. And I think particularly the part, I believe it was called Name Calling, where they interviewed a number of people, and I, I don't know if they, they interviewed you or not, and they all were weighing on, is it gonna be LGBTQ, is it gonna be gay, is it gonna, you know. And I thought that was great because as a straight person, I'm all, my head's always spinning with this terminology. So Mine I, too. I'd like, so I'd li I was happy to see gay people have the same uh, problem. So my question is, uh, do you have any particular feelings about the terminology, uh, any, any particular thoughts about how it has evolved, and any favorites? <laughs> I, I think that the terminology evolved as it did. In, um, it, as I said in the beginning, um, the underground term for all of us was uh, gay. Um, and then, um, with the rise of the feminist movement and the rise of lesbian feminism, lesbians said, well, we're being um, elided in the term gay. We really want some recognition, so it's got to be gay and lesbian. And so it was. For many years, it was gay and lesbian. And then it was the feeling that we really had to be more inclusive of other parts of our community, like bisexuals and uh, transgender people. And so it became LGBT, and I, I could certainly wrap my head around that. And then, of course, young people said, well, I don't identify with any of that. I'm, I'm queer. And so it became LGBTQ. And the last I heard, it was LGBTQQ, the other Q is for questioning, I for intersex, AA for asexual, and also for allies. PP for uh, uh, polyamorous, and <laughs> polygamous, and whatever. <laughs> and I, I, I had really debated um, my title, and at one point I was going to have LGBT on the cover, and then I thought, well, maybe LGBTQ. And then once it got to be LGBTQQIAAPP, I realized there wasn't enough room on the cover. So. <laughs> So I, I went to what was historically accurate. The term gay had been around, as far as I know, since the early 20th century to describe both uh, homosexual men and women. And homosexual, as I said earlier, also included transgender people and even bisexual people who, if they had relationship with the same sex, were considered homosexual. So it's, it's a long history, and I'm, I'm sympathetic to um, the, the drive to recognize all aspects of the community, but I fear that the acronym is getting out of hand with 10 <laughs> letters already. So, so I go back to what I grew up with, that is the word gay. <laughs> for uh, speaking today, and congratulations on your award. Uh, I have uh, a question for you, um, because despite the great, great advances we've seen uh, in our lifetimes, uh, one, of the th one of the larger issues I wanted to see if you could perhaps comment upon is um, how uh, the movement can uh, embrace uh, their, uh, people of color in this country especially. Um, I'm very much struck by um, uh, how wonderful our sellout crowd is for this event, uh, but uh, it still is not representative of certainly uh, our broad, uh, you know, uh, identification across, uh, you know, race as we, describe it in America. 
Uh, so I wanted to see if you could comment on that. Yes. And I also wanted to thank you for revising um, my concept about Angie Dickinson and policewoman, because uh, <laughs> I, I wasn't sure what was going on when I saw that show as an eight-year-old, but I now have a better idea of that, and now she's off the list. So thank you. Yes, yeah. yeah first of all, let me say, I, I don't think there would be a movement, or there wouldn't be much of a movement without people of color. I, I think that that the movement was very influenced by the black movement, and I think most activists realize that and are grateful to to the black movement for leading the way. And even um, Harry Hayes' conception of gay people being an oppressed cultural minority, that was language, of course, that he took from the early Negro movement, as it was called at that time. I, I think the LGBTQ movement is very aware of the fact that, uh, that we owe a lot to um, the African American movement and very aware of the fact that that uh, many LGBTQ people are indeed African American and their stories need to be heard more and more. And I, I tried to do that in the book. I tried to incorporate the stories of African Americans and uh, other uh, racial and uh, uh, ethnic minorities in the book. And I think that's really crucial. Good afternoon. As you know, a little over two years ago, we had the Gay Games here in Cleveland, and thanks to Cleveland Foundation and a host of people who contributed, we threw a hell of a party here in, in town. <laughs> Can you comment on how events like that help progress uh, the progress for the community? Yes. Yeah, I, I was very disappointed because originally the Gay Games were called the Gay Olympics, and the Olympic Committee actually sued the Gay Olympics to change their name, but I, I think it's it's certainly crucial that um, gay athletes come out as they have been. I was absolutely thrilled when Michael Sam came out a couple of years ago as the first out football player while he was still playing football, and a number of other athletes have have come out. Uh, but one reason that, that uh, these athletic programs are so crucial is that they blast through the ridiculous stereotypes that some people still hold in their head about uh, gay men, particularly. Um, so I'm, I, I'm not a, a sports fan myself, but I'm really very, very grateful for the gay games for doing what they've done. Hi, uh, thank you for coming, and this is really great. Um, I just had a question. Uh, for the normal heart, the movie or the play, do you think um, that accurately portrayed the gay community's feeling during that time, the frustration and the happiness? If you comment on that, please, thank yes, you. Yes, yeah. Um, Larry Kramer, who, who wrote The uh, Normal Heart, was actually the founder of ACT UP. And what had happened is that he, uh, he founded a group before that called uh, Gay Men's Health Crisis in New York. And that was a group very much like the one that I'd mentioned earlier, AIDS Project Los Angeles, that did a wonderful job in, in raising uh, millions upon millions of dollars to help make the last months or weeks of people with AIDS easier, but what Larry Kramer realized was that there was a need not to help people die easily, but to help people live, a need to demand that the government get involved in finding medication for a cure, and ACT UP did that. I think they were just really crucial. So yes, I, I love The Normal Heart. It was written at a time when um, uh, there wasn't enough realization in America what was going on, and I think Larry Kramer uh, is a real hero of, of the ACT UP movement, and uh, they, they did incredible things. Uh, uh, the, the protocol for drug testing was actually changed, and it affects uh, everyone now. Um, on certain drugs, there isn't the extended period of seven or eight years of tests as there used to be. As Vito Russo, one of the heroes of the gay community, said when he got AIDS, I don't have seven or eight years for drug testing.
testing. There are all of these things that are out there now that are promising, and, and we have to have them uh, now or within a few months, not after a long period of testing. So uh, Kramer is definitely one of my heroes. Thank you for asking that question. Hi, Ms. Vaderman. Um, I'm so interested in hearing what you think is sort of the next frontier of our movement. I think particularly as a somewhat young um, lesbian, it seems like our goals have become very fractured. So I'm interested in hearing what you think yeah. is coming yeah. next for us. Yeah, I, I think what has to happen is um, we have to be included as part of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which would uh, outlaw discrimination against us just as it outlaws discrimination against other racial and ethnic minorities. Um, there has been an attempt in Congress to pass uh, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, ENDA, for more than 20 years, and it's never happened. I, I think that has to happen. Uh, of course, if the 1964 Civil Rights Act were extended to include us, it, it would uh, mean that there was no necessity for ENDA. But it, it is a problem that in every state of the union now, we can be married, but in so many states, we can be fired without any repercussions to the employer who wants to fire us simply because we're LGBT. So you've, you've outlined a number of the things that have made progress in this country. I'm kind of concerned about, <clears throat> excuse me, the rest of the world. And I know you can't predict the future, uh, but there's some certainly bright spots in the world and there are some dark spots as well. But in terms of the mechanisms that led to our progress, how do you see the rest of the, of the world, uh, whether those mechanisms happen in the rest of the world or whether we're gonna see a bifurcation where some parts of the, of the world have this progress and others just retreat? Yeah, and of course there is a bifurcation now, but but I'm I'm so happy for international LGBT organizations that are tackling the difficult places, and I do see progress worldwide. I I didn't address the rest of the world in the book because it would go from 816 pages to a couple of million pages, but uh, I I. I'm very hopeful about things that have happened in recent years in, in many parts around the world. There are other parts around the world, of course, where you risk your life if you're known to be a homosexual, and I don't know if that's going to change in, in the near future. And actually, um, thinking similarly, I, uh, I've lived overseas for about 10 years, back in the 90s, um, when a lot of my gay friends were coming out, um, they wanted to have kind of mutual tests for AIDS to show their commitments. Um, and particularly in Latin America, the gays wanted nothing of it. Um, and it really hurt the feelings um, and sentiments of relationships between my American gay friends and, and those in Latin America. Ended up being in so, um, Central and uh, Eastern Europe as well. Very similar cultural issues. First of all, I guess I look forward to more of international um, history. I think the scholarship in your book is just terrific for for uh, for shining a light uh, on the importance and the and the varied history that the gay rights movement has. But um, pertaining to that, we live in such a small global world now. Yes. Um, and I guess what would be um, the highlights, I guess, relative to positive aspects of other countries and other cultures relative to embracing and really getting to the hard work of actually approving uh, legislatively uh, human rights, um, as I said, uh, or as yeah. others have said. Yeah, what, what I'm hoping is that um, most of Western Europe approves of uh, same-sex marriage now in the United States, of course, has uh, same-sex marriage all over the, the country. What I'm hoping is that the rest of the world will see that we're doing it and the countries aren't falling apart because of us. And, I, I imagine that evolution will be gradual. It's not going to happen overnight. I, I think often fundamentalist religion, whatever that religion is, has been the biggest enemy of, of uh, rights for LGBT people. But I, I think that, that the longer we live as we live openly, the rest of the world will surely see that, that it's viable 
and prejudice against us will eventually disappear. Lillian, it's my honor to ask the last question today. But um, yesterday on The Sound of Ideas on WCPN, you spoke very eloquently about the evolution of the military and, um, and the extent to which the military at the highest levels and the highest ranks has actually begun to embrace equality. And I wonder if you might close with that. Yes. Yeah, I, um, I, I tell two stories at the beginning of my book. One is a 1948 story of this wonderful professor who was drummed out of the teaching uh, profession because of his homosexuality. And the other is a terrific story of a woman who was uh, promoted in 2012 from colonel to uh, brigadier general, a woman by the name of Tammy Smith. And um, she had married her partner the year before when same-sex marriage became legal in her state. And she uh, uh, told the Department of Defense about her partner. And they said, oh, that, that's a wonderful story. Uh, bring Tracy into all of your interviews. Uh, your story is important, and don't try to hide it. And uh, that's what Tammy Smith did. And I just learned yesterday that she has been promoted to major generals. So the yes, fabulous, fabulous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, and, and so I, I think that the military has, has been very fair in its treatment in recent years of LGBT people. My next book, incidentally, is about uh, Harvey Milk. I'm doing a biography of Harvey Milk for Yale University Press, and I was thrilled to discover that the Navy is naming a ship after Harvey Milk. <laughs> <laughs> He spent four years in the Navy, very closeted, of course. He, he would think this was so fabulous and so <laughs> incredible. <laughs> Thank you. Today at the City Club, we have been enjoying a Friday Forum with Lillian Faderman, the 2016 Annis Field Wolf Book Award winner for nonfiction. Ms. Faderman is here today as part of the Larry and Barbara Robinson Family Foundation Forum, made possible by a generous gift from the Robinsons. Barbara Robinson is here with us today. We thank you for your continued support of City Club. Our community partners for today's forum are the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards, Equality Ohio, the LGBT Community Center of Greater Cleveland, and Plexus. We appreciate your partnership. We welcome guests at tables hosted by Case Western University Sages, the Cleveland Foundation, and Key Bank. We also welcome students from St. Ignatius High School. Student participation in the City Club forums is provided by a grant from the Laub Foundation. We thank all of you for being here. Sales of Ms. Faderman's book, The Gay Revolution, The Story of the Struggle, are provided by a cultural exchange. And that brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you, Ms. Faderman. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Cleveland State University, Robert Conrad, and the Payne Fund.